So, thanks everybody for coming, for joining us today for today's NWC webinar, Tone Setting, Lay Down the Right Sound. Uh, I am your host, Andrew Landhorst, Assistant Editor of Professional Sound Magazine, and jo I'm joined by Mike Fraser, who is, you know, sort of an icon in our industry. He's worked on, like, the last six ACDC records. He's worked with Metallica, Zach Brown Band. He's a, an absolute legend. Thank you so much for joining me, Mike, today. Really appreciate yeah, my it. My pleasure. Yeah, awesome. Looking forward to this. Yeah, so again, head to MikeFraserMix.com if you uh, ever want to inquire about uh, Mike's services. And uh, there you go. So what we'll kind of do, what we're, what we're talking about today is kind of the ethos of recording in, in the sense of the most, almost in the most raw sense, in that, you know, when you're playing live or when you're playing in a room, or, you know, you're just playing an instrument, it's going to make a certain sound. And getting what sounds good for that isn't necessarily going to be the exact same thing that's going to sound good when you're trying to record. And so that's some, sort of what we want to break down today is the approach to tones and getting the right sound for things in the studio. And what we'll start with there is the fact that the right sound is very subjective and if you guys saw the teaser for this, we were talking about personality. So, Mike, the first question that I have for you is, I guess, you know, what to you is the most important thing? And, and like, you know, what is personality to you when you're talking to a musician and, you know, saying this is what things should sound like? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, a lot of it sort of begins with the song and what are they trying what personality are they trying to put into the song you know it uh they choose their you say a guitar uh the sound of the guitar for the type of song that they've written say it's a ballad you're going to want you know probably a cleaner sounding guitar floaty sort of sound you know if it's a hard rock guitar it's you know going to be very aggressive so that's sort of the beginning and um and while they've written their songs, they'll have those sort of sounds in their head. So we'll discuss that, uh, what we're looking for, say, uh, on the basic track, you know, just the overall sound of, of what they want their instruments to sound like. And then in the studio, we just try and capture that, you know. So uh, whether it's amp settings on his amps, um, on drums, it's, you know, size of their drums, their toms, their kick, their snare. There's so many variables. So that'll be kind of discussed pre-recording uh then we load into the studio and and attempt to to capture that you know little tweaks here and there and hopefully we we, we do our job <laughs> yeah cool and uh as far as that went um i remember when we talked before it was kind of the idea of like thinking about instruments themselves and like how a certain instrument or a certain amp can kind of play into personality that way or like the, you know somebody you know a player will bring in one piece of gear and fire it up and then you realize oh that's not the right feeling you know how are you managing that kind of thing and i guess how do you know even though somebody is telling you this is my instrument this is my sound how can you sort of tell when that might not actually be the case or it might not serve the song as well as they might think well it's as simple as you say you know you basically say it's a guitar you just plug it in and it's like Oh, gee, I've got a, you know, a Les Paul and I want a really sort of thin uh, guitar sound. Well, the Les Paul's not going to get it. So you say, OK, did you bring a strap with you then? Mm -hmm. Or let's get a strap because that'll be a better beginning spot for that type of sound that we want to get. So, you know, you just plug it in and give it a go. Like uh, I've had guys show up with sort of homemade guitars and go, uh oh, but they plug it in and it's like, oh, great. OK, that's the sound you're after. Let's let's use it. So it's, you know, it, you can always tell by the sound of the instrument right there. And um, sometimes if that's what you're stuck with, you know, you have to jump through a few hoops mm -hmm. to attain the sound that they're looking for. But uh, when at all possible, we'll just change up the instrument, change up the amp, uh, you know, try a different head on the, on the drums. Uh, you know, we work hard to try and get the, uh, the artist happy. Yeah. I guess in that regard too, yeah. How, you know, in terms of getting a sound, like obviously, yeah, like a Les Paul is going to have Les Paul characteristics, a Strat's going to have Strat characteristics. But at the same time, in terms of doing that, uh, you know, how much of the right sound do you think is coming from the player versus from the instrument? 
Oh, a lot. And let me tell you a, a cool little story. I did a, a record with, um, with Mo Foster. So he's a bass player, played with Jeff Beck and stuff. And he was telling us a story about uh, Jeff had been working on a guitar sound, a, a solo sound or something all night in the studio. And uh, so Mo had gone home. He, Mo came in first thing in the morning. Jeff's guitar rig was all still set up and was turned on. And so he picked up his guitar just to see, you know, what it sounded like and that. And so it sounded horrible. And just then Jeff walked in the room and he goes, what did you do? He says, Mo says, I didn't do anything. I didn't touch a thing. So Jeff grabs the guitar and plays it. And there was the sound. So a lot of it comes from the player and the fingers, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and how he's doing it. And it's amazing how different it can be. You know, I don't really play, but I'll pick up, say, you know, Mal's guitar, Angus guitar, and give it a strum. <laughs> and uh, yeah, no, <laughs> it's not, not the same sound at all. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 an interesting thing. How is yeah? Like at the end of the day, again, a Strat sound is a Strat sound, and a Les Paul sound is a Les yeah. Paul sound. But who's playing it? You know. A strat being played by, you know, one of one of the youngs is not going to sound like a strat being played by David Gilmore. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> which is which is, you know, so that's that's kind of the first thing, which is that like, you know, it's the first thing towards getting the right sound, I feel, is having an intimate understanding of yourself as a player and what you're actually looking for. Would, would you agree with that? Oh, definitely. And I think a lot of players work long and hard not only on their you know physical playing technique but also work on their sound and what sound that they are looking for for themselves you know Mm -hmm. so then that that gets to the that gets to the next kind of part of it which is um you know the whole in the room versus recording um like how often do you find that you know a player will come in and you know you'll be like hey set up your amp get that going how you like it Mm-hmm. And then you stick a mic on it and it doesn't translate it all the way, you know, the way that they had intended to, or it comes through the mic and it's like, Oh, why does it sound so thin or things like that? Like how, you know, how often do you find that happens and you have to kind of explain like, Hey, it's not going to be the same one-to-one. Necessarily. Yeah, quite, quite often because uh, say you set up your guitar amp, and you're out in a room you know, your ears hear differently. You're hearing all the little reflections off the room. Uh, in the microphone, you kind of stick right in front of the cabinet. So, you know, <laughs> you're not using it <laughs> for the cabinet. So it's going to sound different. But you know, my job is to try and capture that sound. And maybe it's got to be a couple of microphones. Maybe i got to put up a room mic and, and, and try and capture it. But, you know, it's a funny thing because, you know, you put up a couple of mics and a room mic. And you just add a little bit of that room mic in and all of a sudden it's just way too roomy. So your ears are canceling out things and your brain decides what, what you're wanting to hear. And sometimes it isn't really what you're hearing because when you put microphones in those spots, oh, gee, that sounds different. So, you know, there's a lot of little techniques moving the mics across the speakers, forward and back from the cabinets. And, uh, you know, you're trying to get as close to that guitar sound in the control room as you're hearing out out uh, out by the amp. You know, yeah, uh, actually, it's, it's definitely a struggle sometimes. Mm. I, I just I just had a funny thought actually. Like in that regard, has it ever um, has it ever sort of happened where like you'll have a player and you'll be kind of. <laughs> they'll be in the control room playing and you'll be dialing the sound up and they'll be kind of, you know, not necessarily happy with what they're hearing in the control room. And then you'll like maybe send them out and be like, just go play it out with your amp in the room, go play it there, then come back in. Yeah. And like the sort of placebo effect there, has that ever come up? Yeah. A lot of times, but sometimes the other way around, they're not really liking what they're hearing out at the amp, but they come in the control room and say, like, okay. oh, oh, this is way better. Um, so quite often, even, even if ultimately they're going to be playing in the studio with the rest of the band, when we're setting up tones, I'll have them bring their guitar head into the control room right. and run a speaker cord out there so that we can sit there and just dial the sound in without the raging, <laughs> the raging, uh, speaker cabinets, you know, and, and yeah. exactly how they want. And I find that's a little easier because again, you're out in the big room and sometimes it can fool you what what's really coming out of your amp. So, uh, Mm -hmm. so we do it that way. It seems to work a little, uh, get things done a little quicker that way, you know? 
Yeah, and like I know we've 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 just sort of focused more on guitar here, but to kind of right, yeah, stay on that just real briefly is like because I find that that's an interesting thing when it comes to recording as as a guitar player, yeah. which is that like and it also just leans into the whole like Sims versus real amps thing to an extent. Where it's like, I find that sitting in the control room and playing and then just getting the signal right from the amp, that feels like playing a sim because you're just hearing the impulse response. Right. Whereas yeah. when you're actually playing it with the amp, you're hearing like the super low resonance and the power and everything. And for some players, that makes such a big difference in terms of how they're feeling the music. Yeah, they're feeling their pant legs shake and, and whatnot, you know? Yeah, you know, or they just... Yeah, getting the, the, the vibrating colon just like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I will say, you know, it's hard to get the whole drum kit into the control room, so we can't do that. <laughs> drums. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I guess that's, so I guess we could look at drums next. Um, because I think the one thing that anybody who's set up and recorded a drum kit, you know, whether, you know, whether they're just doing it for fun or in a professional context is that if you just set up a drum kit and put mics on it and don't do anything with it, it doesn't sound nearly as powerful as a drum kit in the room does. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and so, you know, so how are you approaching things to, you know, make make a drum kit sound larger than life in a recording? Right. And it sound like have the impact and the power and just that, you know, the bigness that a drum kit has when you're standing in the room next to it. Yeah. Well, personally, I like using uh, a, a fair bit of mics on the drum kits. You know, some guys can do it with, you know, two or three mics and do a great job at it. I could never get that sound working for me. So I use tend to use a lot of mics, but I'm really careful with phasing. You know, when you've got multiple mics, you know, sometimes that mic will cancel out what this mic's picking up. So you got to be really careful with phasing. So I use a lot of mics. Uh, some of the rooms up here in Vancouver, where uh, I mostly work, uh, the Armory is uh, one studio and the Warehouse, another studio. They've got big rooms, uh, but they're controllable. So uh, with a couple of baffles around the drums, I can get a really tight drum sound, add in my, my sort of mid-level room mics, get a, a bigger room sound. And then you add the far room mics, and you get a giant sound. And I can control all that so that the drums aren't always washy uh so then and you have the option when you're mixing to go oh let's really get the drums nice and tight and dry in the verse and then in the chorus bring in the room the room tracks you know so yeah. that i don't rely on reverb or you know, anything you know you can add it but i like the natural sounding drums so you know uh, a lot of the drum sounds too are down to drum the tuning of the drums you know if there's wobbles in the in the snare and the and the toms if you want that pure sort of really um, impactful sound, it, you know, mm -hmm. the tuning's really important as well. And then uh, I discovered a number of years ago that uh, we had a drum tech and he could actually tune the drums to the key of the song. So I try and do that because it's amazing what that does, you know, then the yeah. bass and the kick drum resonate at the same note and, uh, you know, or the snare can resonate. It, it's just amazing what it does for the song. It just kind of really, uh, brings it together so uh mm -hmm. yeah a lot of work on drums but um i think i could get them sounded as big as they are in the room to yeah the, to the drummer. i i think i think one of the like it's the same thing that comes to sort of being in the room with the guitar amp too when it comes to get like if you pay attention to pretty much any record that a big part of the drum sound is just the room yeah um yeah that's like because that's where the, the, the decay is actually coming from that's where the trail's coming from even though it's just we're so used to hearing that as part of you know you look at somebody playing a drum kit you're so used to just hearing the room as as part of the, the drums that's just it yeah, yeah. and it's even, it's even if it's a small room you know yeah. it doesn't have to be a big reverberated room even if it's a small room we're always hearing that space um you know like recording drums outside is really difficult because the sound just escapes. It just goes away. Like, you mm -hmm. know, it's really hard. You put a mic on it and say, boy, that snare sounds horrible, but it doesn't sound too bad outside here, but you put a mic on it and I guess there's nothing really containing the sound for the mic to pick up or something, but it's really difficult. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, it's an interesting thing in that regard. So I find in that regard, like how, like, <laughs> 
you know, miking up something for 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 like country or whatever, you know, for example, the with Zach Brown man, the, the girl sessions, for example, like that kind of drum setup versus something for Phil Rudd. Right. Right. And, and like yeah. you know, rock drums versus country drums, like what are the fundamental differences in terms of how those might be approached? Is it just the is it the miking? Is it the drums themselves? Is it the that are being used or is it how you're processing them? You know, it's a little bit of both, uh, but I would say, you know, just generally like a rock drummer uh, just really beats the heck out of his. his right. Rock. I guess the player there, too, is also. Yeah. Yeah. So he's really smacking the, the drums really hard. So in a lot of instances, you've kind of got to pull the microphone back and let uh, let that that sound kind of come off the drum more mm-hmm. by pulling the mic back though you're going to get a lot more leakage of say cymbals into your snare drum which becomes a problem uh later on as well but you know when you're really close and he's really smacking it like like phil rudd is a really heavy hitter if you get the snare too close all you get is the the quick attack and you don't really get the tone of the drum so mm-hmm. you gotta kind of pull it back to kind of get the tone um you know more country drummers and jazz drummers are a lot more finesse and they're a lot lighter hitting. So, uh, you know, you've got to capture all the little subtle notes, you know, they might have a a snare on the two and four, but in between they're, they have little ghost notes. So you've got to make sure you're capturing those because that's part of their feel. That's what's making the, the, the song swing along, you know, it's all those little stuff you don't really hear, but you, you do, you know? So, uh, you know, you got to mic it a little bit different to kind of capture those notes, so it's not so much the hit; it's it's the whole snare. Uh, yeah, and I guess for in that regard too, if you're because again, if I'm thinking about something like a jazz recording mm-hmm. compared to compared to like a very polished rock record, again, it comes back to like I feel like in a, like on a jazz instance where there is a lot more of that detail, you're probably going to be using more of the overheads. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. To kind yeah. of get more of the picture of the kit, right? Than just yeah. like the individual stuff. And I feel that's like that's another big one. It's how like how often are you changing what you're doing? Like, do you have a pretty set philosophy for overheads, or do you change it up all the time? Uh, I have a pretty set philosophy, but then you know most of the time I'm just doing rock drummers. So <laughs> you know, I know yeah. I know what's worked in the past, and uh, as I'm getting the the drums set up, if that's not working, you know I'll move them around a little bit. But I've sort of got a a setting and I like a couple of set like I like close mic overheads and then I've also got a, a pair of overheads above so that helps get the nice okay attack of the symbols but then the decay comes from the further mics you know okay how, yeah. how many mics would you say you have in your typical oh, drum set I'd say somewhere between 25 and awesome 30 or something like that because sometimes nice. I'll double mic the toms so you yeah. get the plop and the tone off the bottom and yeah it, it, it's like putting together a jigsaw puzzle when i'm setting the drums up because you know also depending on where the drummer's got a cymbal sometimes they like it just off the tom tom sometimes they're up so you got to try and fit microphones in between cymbals and stuff that he's not going to hit and yeah uh, they put together a jigsaw puzzle sometimes yeah so i guess is to take to to take that the other way, I guess, what advice would you have for people who are in a situation where, you know, you can't mic up a drum kit with 25 mics and maybe only have like three or four, what would you say is the best approach to kind of getting a really solid drum tone from that? Well, you know, you just decide what you're looking for from your drums. So like, you know, if it's a jazz drummer, he's going to be a lot busier on his say snare drum, hi-hat and, you know, even maybe even overheads, he might be playing, you know, little triplet things or, or something. So, you're going to want to get a good, at least stereo image, stereo pair of microphones above the, the drums. And you're probably going to want a, a microphone on the kick and snare. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, with four mics, you could get by really nicely because you're going to want your, you know, be able to control the punch of your kick and snare. And the overheads are going to pick up some of that snare stuff, uh, all the cymbals, um, hi-hat, you know. Mm-hmm. That kind of thing. So you could get by probably with four, four well-placed mics. Yeah, uh, And then just, you know, as you're getting your drum sounds, just, you know, listen to what you're doing. You may have to move your overheads further back or closer in or, you know, adjust them because you've only got four mics. You, you want to find the, the perfect spot for all four of them that's getting the sound that you're, you're trying to get. Yeah, cool. 
So let's move on to the next one, which to me I think is kind of one of the, it's one of the most obvious ones, but at the same time, like has maybe the largest margin for error, which is vocals mm -hmm. and the whole idea of vocal tone. Because typically we always like vocal tone is usually interpreted as like just what does a singer sound like? Right. Yeah. But when you're recording, that's a whole other animal. I find because it's like you more or less actually have to work with them in terms of the style of singing and the power that they're singing at and the position and their body language. So what are you looking for when you're kind of setting up for a vocalist? Well, you know, it's it's basically what kind of voice they have. So uh, like, say, uh, Michael Bublé or something, you know, you're going to want a nice, silky kind of tube mic that's nice and warm. Um uh, doesn't get too harsh in the top end. So you're going to want a top quality mic for that because then the top end is, you know, nice and silky. Um, and then say on the other end of the spectrum, uh, say Brian Johnson. So Brian, I, I use like a, a 57 because really it, it takes all the abuse that those guys can scream out there, you know, and, and Brian likes to sing with a handheld anyways, because that's just what he's used to live. So he just, you know, coils the cord around his arm and away he goes. So, um, and it sounds really good. And I actually used the 57 on Steven Tyler too. And we did the Aerosmith thing because I think, you know, as their voices developed, it was mostly live and that's kind of what they're used to. If you use a good quality mic, like a, a expensive mic, uh, you know, it, the asses get really sibilant on it. Uh, sometimes the mic will kind of shut down temporarily, uh, just with their power and moisture coming off their, their voice. Even when you got a pop screen, it'll kind of, so, you know, it just depends on, on what you're going and what kind of voice you mm -hmm. have. You know, uh, I find a lot of women when they get up in a higher range, uh, have quite a, a harsh sounding, you know, when they, the, the chords tighten up, they get the high notes are harsh sounding. So you've again, got to pick a mic that can control that kind of harshness because you don't want to really EQ it out. Cause that's, that's the sound of their voice and that's, what's making things cut, but it can be painful in the speakers if you're not controlling it properly. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So as far as be beyond mic choice, how are, how do you use like placement, for example, I guess that d changes depending on the mic, I guess, if it's a dynamic or if it's a condenser or yeah. It does. Uh, generally, like I've always got a, a pop screen, so um, just a little thin, uh, you know, sometimes a pair of nylons works over a wire or whatever, but there's they're pop screens. And I set that about, you know, maybe two, two inches away from the microphone. And then I like the singer to sing right up on the mm -hmm. pop, screen, right where I put it. So kind of use that as the, hey, put, yeah, put your face yeah. here reference. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then, you know, uh, that's for the, the the majority of the vocal, but when they go for the big scream, I always try and get them. If, if you're going to scream, you know, just, you can kind of, you know, self um, attenuate yourself, you know, and you watch yeah. a lot of singers, you know, with their mic, they're, they're doing that while they're, they're attenuating themselves because I've got a level set and the compressor set for a sound like that. But then all of a sudden when they're like that, it's just going to overload everything. So they've got to back off a, a little bit. So there's a, yeah. a you know, they can control their own sound. And sometimes you've got to work with a, say a novice singer a, a lot more and, and kind of teach them how to help their sound out, you know? Mm -hmm. In that regard, if, especially if you're working with somebody who is very dynamic, um, mm -hmm. I, how, you know, what, what precautions are you taking in that regard then to make sure that, you know, there's not, you know, the take doesn't sound inconsistent in terms of like, oh, this is, you know, it's quiet here and you can hear it, but in this part, it's a little louder, but you can also hear a bunch of room because they're backed up <laughs> right. and are also louder than before kind of thing. So like, you know, right. how, how are you balance, like dealing with those considerations? Well, you know, uh, sometimes when we're doing a vocal, uh, I get to learn um, those spots in the song. So I'll ride the, the, the level of mic to tape. Oh yeah. To, to try and help me out with that um you know as far as the the vocal sounding more roomy when they get screamy well that's just kind of how it is uh mm -hmm. you can get them to do it a little bit close to the mic and i turn the mic down a bit uh to to help that and then sometimes 
you know, it was a great take except for that one spot. So you say, okay, can we do that again? And when you do that line, let's just have you just stand back here and sing that or right. your head away. Or, just or just totally just change yeah. this, just change the parameters altogether for that one line kind of thing. Yeah. And then, you know, compression and dual compression, like I'll, I'll do little bits, but with two different compressors. Okay. That, that helps control that, uh, uh, you know, the, the balance and levels of the vocal. And then, then when you're mixing, sometimes you really got to ride the vocal, you know, mm-hmm. and that verse too quiet. So you got to really push it up. Oh, here comes the chorus, pull it down. <laughs> yeah. And so, in terms of, as far as that goes, just in terms of the compressors that you're using, like what kind of styles of compressors are you using in order there? Does it, um, does it change or do you have a chain that you kind of, I've kind of got a chain. I've got a really good 1176, uh, that's just killer. Um, and then a friend of mine, uh, Ross Robinson, has uh, one of the original ones. It's called a 176. So it was like Ooh. a precursor to the 1176. And that thing's magic. So we found, we just finished working with this band called Molotov. So when we're doing vocals, we put the two of them together. And now I've got to find myself a 176 now. Mm-hmm. That, that was just magic. Yeah. Just amazing, you know. Yeah. Uh, you set it on kind of a mid mid speed you know not too fast attack or not too slow but sort of a mid attack and then uh, i like it one of them anyways on a quick release so it's grabbing the vocal and then it's letting it go right away and then the other one maybe on a mid release so they're both doing different things and you don't hear the compression getting yeah. in and sucking uh and doing any of that kind of stuff so uh that's kind of what i like to do you know mm-hmm. And then I guess as far as just talking about compressors and stuff, and I guess that's like fundamentally that's a pretty big part of a vocal tone because I guess like, again, depending on what the genre is, yeah. uh, you know, a vocal's going to need varying levels of smack, so to speak. Yeah. Because if, you know, if it's a, if it's something like a pop song or, or a rap verse, you know, it really needs to have a constant punch and that harder compression. Whereas for something more like jazz or whatever, it needs to be much more natural, right? That's right, yeah. yeah. And, and so that's more a matter of just kind of letting them sit back and do their thing. Yeah, yeah. But I like a really nicely compressed vocal because, you know, you hear, you know, all the little lip smacks, uh, little breaths. And to me, that's what makes it sound real because, you know, when you're hearing somebody sing right beside you you're hearing all that so Mm -hmm. uh when you hear a recorded voice and there's and somebody's taking all the breaths out uh it sounds unnatural to me and it actually makes me get out of breath because i'm waiting for them to breathe and i was kind of (laughs) holding my breath along with them it's like oh my god they they never breathe this whole song (laughs) yeah how did they do it how did they do that yeah it's 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 a it's a really interesting thing. I and then from there, I guess we we, we can also look at you know pianos, keyboards, and stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Um, again, so like for for piano sounds, I guess depending on whether it's a grand or a, an upright or things like that, like yeah. Generally, what's what's your philosophy for like? We'll start with the grand, just because. Like well, with, with the grand, I like to have a nice. Uh, stereo pair use you know either a, a Neumann eighty sevens or something like that or mm-hmm. condenser mics uh, up above the keys and again I don't like to get too close because they they get to sound a little bit too harsh so you you want it far enough up off the keys that uh, you get a nice stereo image and nice warmth and then I also find if I put a mic down sort of at the lower soundboard down the bass strings you can add in some of that sort of nice, nice warm bottom end. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the, for me, a piano is really subjective to where it's being used and for what in a song, because you get this great sounding, you know, classical piano sound and you put a couple of heavy guitars on top of that. It's like that sound just disappears. So then you've got to mm-hmm. really kind of make it sound um, bright and, and clanky and uh, you got to watch that with some pianos because now you have this nice sounding grand that all of a sudden sounds like a honky tonk piano. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. it's, it's tricky to, it depends on what you're surrounding it with, you know? Mm-hmm. Do, you like, hmm? do you like to get a lot of the felt? Oh, uh, you know, again, because I'm mostly doing rock stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
I don't that that subtlety is kind of uh, lost a lot of times. But uh, yeah. I have done the occasional sort of country thing or or softer stuff. And and yes, I like all the natural sound of the piano. You know, maybe not the piano stool squeaking or anything, but <laughs> you know, all the subtleties because yeah. you know, that's what they're putting into their their style of playing. You know, all the little quiet notes and loud notes and dynamics and and everything. Uh, I like it all. Yeah, piano especially is an important one to kind of really be getting the dynamics from. And yeah. actually, though, you mentioned the whole, like, sometimes you can dial up that sound and then dial up the rest of the sounds and be like, oh, that doesn't work. So in the context of kind of building a track up um, mm -hmm. and getting and getting your sounds for each instrument or element of the song, what in your mind is kind of like a smart way to actually like an order way to order those so that you're actually making sure you're getting the right thing for each relative to everything else in the song yeah well if the song's sort of uh focused around a piano obviously you get your piano <laughs> sound first and then dial the rest of the instruments around the piano um you, you may again have to come back to the piano and adjust that a little bit once you've got the rest of the things, but your main focus is going to be the piano sound. Uh, so you get that. Um, and then there's ways of recording and EQing the other instruments to leave room for the piano. So if you like all the low notes in the bottom end on the piano, uh, you've got to sort of make sure you say so your bass guitar isn't masking those, you know, mm -hmm. you want to hear what the piano's doing. Or at very least the bass guitar notes are complementing what the piano's doing. They're not clashing, you know, so uh you've got to be careful of all that. So it depends on what your focus in is. You know, if the piano's just uh added on top of a song, well then you're probably going to want a little bit thinner of a piano sound so that it cuts through. Mm -hmm. Um it doesn't get too harsh sounding. Uh so that's always tricky. You get your your band and your, the, the focus of your song done, and then you add the piano to that and say, oh, okay, I need to back those um, mics off a little bit so it sounds a little bit more roomy so it fits into this spot because, you know, if it sounds too close, it's going to be too loud, and by the time you pull that back in the mix, you're not going to hear it. So, you mm -hmm. know, if you add a little more room to it, it can sit back in the mix and you're going to hear it, so... Cool. Uh, I, so that sort of also leads into another question is, I guess, um, is does, does your approach change to just the engineering side specifically? Uh, does your approach change to how you're recording things if you know you're going to also be mixing versus if somebody else is going to be mixing? Yeah, if somebody else is going to be mixing, I'm way more careful. <laughs> I don't want to embarrass myself. No. no, my approach is the same. You know, I like mm -hmm. to try and capture, you know, in essence, what we're trying to capture is magic. And so you're making that all the, uh, the musicians and everybody as comfortable and as relaxed as possible um, while you're doing all these, trying to change their sound and capture things and that you want them to relax and just just play how they play, you know, because that's why they're mm -hmm. there in the first place. So I, I approach it the same, you know, uh, whether I'm mixing it or somebody else is mixing. Okay, cool. Yeah, because that's that's uh, really depends on 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 who it is. Because I feel like, uh, you know, s some people will say that, like, you know, at this point, kind of the mix is so much a fundamental part of what the song sounds like. So you know, as the engineer, or if you're the producer, especially, you know, you kind of want to maybe dictate the, that direction as much as you can with the engineering. But if you don't have that, you know, mm -hmm. if you're not going to be the one making those decisions with the mix, it's like, would you just, you know, make things as are as natural as possible and then just say, here you go. It's an interesting, yeah, it's an interesting well, balance I was, there. I was taught by guys. So in their era, when you recorded, you know, they're still working on eight and 16 tracks. So, so when they're recording, they're actually kind of mixing at the same time, you know, mm -hmm. uh, committing, you know, drums to a stereo pair plus a kick and snare or something like that. So um, I kind of missed that era. Uh, it was just past when I was doing it, but I got trained by those guys. And then of course we went into, you know, multi-track, you know, 24 track, 48 track, and now unlimited on, on Pro Tools. So I think that art is getting lost because I get some mixes where it's they've got 80 tracks of a four-piece rock band and they've got 80 tracks of stuff. So I've got to go through and 
<laughs> you know, yeah, want everything and then try and get in their head. Okay, well, what were you looking for when you were doing these 80 tracks? And I've got to try and guess what their thing is. So, you know, I hate mixing stuff like that. You know, it seems like nobody does any pre work as then record it like they want it to sound play back. They just record it to tape and then say, Oh, but uh, then we'll get it in the mix. Mm -hmm. more of the school well, let's get it while we're recording though you know i i do record it a, a, across a bunch of tracks but i always have that in mind whether it's me mixing or somebody else it's going to be pretty apparent what we were going yeah to, so know. okay so what i get from that is that ultimately like as the engineer and the person making the recordings like you should sort of take agency to dictate and say hey this is what the sound is yeah and yeah. then the mixer's job is to mix it not to, to actually dictate to the sound. It. Yeah, to balance it. And, yeah. yeah. And, you know, maybe help this, the sound out for sure, because there are going to be some decisions like, do we use all these room mics on the drums through the whole song or, or where mm -hmm. they, you know, so that's going to be taste uh, during the mix for sure. Cool. Yeah. And like, as, as far as, you know, for in this case, I feel like for the most part, we're, it's going to be more of a case of people working on their own stuff. So I think it's, it's, you know, for, for the audience. Yeah. Like if you're recording record as though, you know, record with the final project or product in mind, not necessarily or approach everything with the final product in mind, not just like, I want this to sound like this. I think that's important. Well, I had a, a project once come in and the guy uh, said, Oh yeah. Well, when I was recording this, he says, um, I was just using plug. I had a DI on my guitar and I was just using amp simulator plugins, but I know you have way better amps at the studio. So I've just given you the DI tracks and like, okay, well, you know, I'm not producing this. I'm just mixing it. So, uh, and you know, yeah, I have a like, guitar amps, but it's going to take me hours and sometimes days to set all that up and go through each song and decide what sound you were going for. So, just record what you want. Like, you know, if you want a delay on your soul, then record it. <laughs> you know, yeah. I've had one in the mix, but again, I'm guessing what you wanted, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So. It's, it's, it's an interesting thing too, because obviously, you know, pe different people are, you want to accomplish different things mm -hmm. with, with what they're doing. So, I mean, but again, I think what you, what it could be, you know, what it can boil down to is again, I think it, it's about intention and like, ultimately you know experiment until things sound like they should sound and like you want them to sound yeah um, yeah you know, as a songwriter you know you, you you've learned to play an instrument and you know when you're doing recording your instrument then you know have your song in mind and what, what does feeling does that instrument you you want it to portray and get that sound that sound you know if you want a sad song get that so that guitar sad get that piano sad sounding you know mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I guess, you know, and that can be done in so many different ways, whether it's mic placement, whether yeah. it's, you know, doing a single mono mic or a stereo pair, or, yeah. you know, doing further placement for more rim or intimate placement. It's all really, really fascinating stuff, and it's just, mm -hmm. you know, it's not, a you know, recording stuff isn't just a matter of throw a mic on it. It's throw a mic on it with intention. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Yeah. Which, which which is cool, but and then the 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 last thing that I kind of want to get into before we get a, get to some questions is the sort of like what your thoughts are on kind of recordings for the sake of like recording a performance versus recording for the sake of like making a production. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, and that's that's always a balance. Um, again. I always believe my job is to try and capture the magic. So obviously, I'm I'm more wanting the performance mm -hmm. um but sometimes depending on player ability sometimes that performance needs to be repeated many times to get mm -hmm. a, a, a you know kind of a more mistake free thing you know like some mistakes are great some mistakes are horrible so you're trying to get it to sound as good as you can um so that's a balance because once you have to start playing things over and over and over again the magic kind of starts disappearing because now the player's concentrating on what he's doing or hitting or, or doing and not letting the music flow through him. So it's a, it's a tricky thing. Uh, I try and capture things fast so people don't have time to start thinking about it. Mm -hmm. um, 
But again, you're balancing uh, the ability. And, you know, there are things, especially in Pro Tools, you can go in and, and edit and, you know, grid the drums and all that kind of stuff. But I don't like that because, again, it ruins the magic. The magic is the mistakes and everything as long as it's not, you know, way out of tune or way out of time. Um, mm -hmm. That stuff's cool. Yeah. And I guess that, that leads me to another question, I guess, of just like um, – you know, that balance of what is magic versus like how magic can something be before it's like technically bad from like a recording standpoint, you know what I mean? Because yeah. ultimately, especially if like for, for your work, if you're having to deliver stuff to labels and stuff, and then it's like, what the hell is this recording? And it's like, oh, we thought it sounded cool, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's <laughs> like, right. <laughs> I know, you know, I think, I think people go too far the other way nowadays with, you know, all the auto tuning on vocals and mm -hmm. um, editing the heck out of, uh, out of all the, the music tracks. Um, and it, everything's just sounding too perfect now. And it just doesn't sound natural to me. Like, you know, when you go and see a band, well, actually even some of the bands are using auto tune live now, but um, you know, when you go and see a band, like you come away from that experience is like, wow, that was, that was amazing. That was great. But if you heard that that recording of that show that you saw, you would go, oh, I never realized those guitars were so out of tune. Oh, he's not hitting all the notes in his vocal. Oh, that piano sound was horrible. But you, you're hearing the experience, and that's what I'm trying to capture in the studio. So uh, on record, you know, you're going to hear that over and over and over. So I need to kind of smooth over some of the warts, but I believe a lot of the magic is in those warts. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, if the label doesn't like that, well, then uh, I don't know. <laughs> In the band, think it's awesome. So yeah, it's it's interesting, and I, it's it's the whole you know the live versus recording thing is always just it's it's a debate that'll never end. It's it's interesting because I I find that it can also go too far in the other direction. I find like uh, where you go see a band and they you know, they just blow you away and then you go listen to the record and it sounds like they're, you know, it sounds like they've got bean bags for a drum kit and you're like, right. Yeah. Yeah. Where's the power? I thought you guys were like, you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's an interesting thing in that regard too, where it's like, you need the band to sound like the record, but the record also needs to sound like the band. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But uh, cool. With that, with that, we got about fifteen minutes to go. So let's get into some some questions here. All righty. All right. Let me see what I got. I've been trying to glance at some of the chat stuff, but it's hard to yeah. <laughs> talk and listen. And and uh, so I'll let you just read out some of the questions. And okay. So we this is this one's from Neil. It's kind of similar to what we've talked about in a way. So like, how often does the sound in the room? need to be different from the recorded sound to fit into the mix yeah you know i guess fairly often um because you know what you're recording in the room needs to fit into the mix but uh you know you don't want to say put all this low end stuff on your on your heavy guitars because the bass is covering that so in the mix if you got these really bottom heavy guitars you know big powerful thing but now there's no room for the bass and the kick drum and everything that needs to live in that sort of bottom frequency gets muddied out. So you're going to have to, you know, change your guitar tone. So that's, you know, a little bit higher and you've just got to leave little spots. That's I guess what you're doing when you're mixing is you put together a jigsaw puzzle of different tones. You know, you got your cymbals up top and your bass down in the middle and you're trying to fit everything else so that it's uh, not interfering each other and you hear everything in the mix. Cool. Um, Elizabeth asked, uh, I hope we covered this, but yeah, can any of this information today be useful for a singer vocalist? We talked about vocals. I hope, I hope that covered what you needed to. If you do have any more questions about that, Elizabeth, just let, uh, just let us know. Um, let's see. This one's from Andrew, not me. Uh, with all those drum mics, at what point do you address any phase slash time slash polarity issues? Is most of that done when placing mics, then touched up at mix using software tools? I, I do that mostly while I'm recording the drums. You know, when I'm getting the drum sounds, I'll check the polarity phase issues. Uh, sometimes they're not completely 180 outs because I've got a button that can flip the phase, you know, um, 
and sometimes they're not 180 out. So if it's really becomes a problem, I'll have to start moving mics a little bit until it increases. Mm -hmm. uh, because I guess phase is sort of the time difference that the sound is, is arriving at the both two different microphones, you know? So if you move one of them, that time difference is going to change and the phase will change. So uh, I don't like leaving it till later because then it's always going to be a problem. So I like to address it as I'm setting up and ready to record. Yeah, I find with drums especially, you just don't want to record them out of phase. Just, just no. yeah, because no. like as as far as that goes, like usually it'll be like yeah, kind of rough it in. I don't know if Mike, if you ever like to do the old mic cable trick from the snare. <clears throat> I've heard of that and I've seen it done, but I've never tried it myself because you know uh, basically I'm very lazy, so <laughs> <laughs> I try to do things as easy as it is. Like it, it looks fine. It looks fun. Yeah. Yeah. I've got, sometimes I'll use a mic. Uh, it's a little trick I got off. Oh, is that maybe Brendan? Anyways. Um, so you put a mic on the figure of eight right down by your kick drum, and then you can turn it around. So it's kind of looking at the bottom snare and kind of looking at your kick drum. You find a spot for it and compress it. Now that's going to be uh, in one polarity. Uh, you, it does this cool thing on the kick. And if you flip polarity, it does a cool thing in the snare. So that's one that you're always, always playing with through the recording. And when you're mixing, it's like, oh, maybe I'll try it. We'll flip the, oh, I like what it's doing on the kick, but the snare sounds better when it's this way. So I'll do it. So that's, that's pretty cool. That's always a fun little little bike to play around with later. <laughs> nice. But yeah, with, with, with drums especially, but if anything with phase where you're kind of setting up with multiple mics, like including even if you've got two mics on a guitar cab, you're yeah. going to want to just like record some audio, look at your waveforms, make sure, you know, listen to it, make sure it's either in or out of phase, you know, and then yeah. adjust your mics until it's right and then record. Never, that's yeah. something you don't want to leave until it's too late. That's right. Okay, this one's from Ronson. Do you ever reamp guitars or use multiple guitar amps in conjunction? Uh, what's your process there? Has the ability to do this nowadays benefited your process, or do you find making tone decisions initially and sticking to them is better? Uh, no, I like using um, like all of the above, <laughs> to be honest. Um, when we're tracking, like recording the band live, most of the time we pick one head. It's just simpler to get the sound of, and you don't have to use multiple uh, cabinets. And, you know, cause a lot of the times the, uh, the little ISO boost don't have room for multiple cabinets. So we'll pick a, a sound and do that. But when we're, you know, overdubbing guitars, uh, sometimes we'll have three and sometimes maybe even four heads going at the same time out to four different cabinets. And I've got a splitter box. So the guitar goes into a splitter box and then that, will part out i think you get sometimes eight or 16 different outputs into each different head so I can yeah he did actually mention the jd7 here <laughs> yeah yeah so that uh you can control the phase because sometimes by plugging two heads together it'll put that one head out of phase so you, you've got a, a phase switch on your on your sends uh and then you blend those in sometimes some guys record each of those cabinets on separate tracks so if you got four cabinets you got four tracks for your guitar sound Myself, mm -hmm. I like to blend them as as I go. So I end up with, you know, either a stereo pair of uh, tracks or a mono track, and I'll find the blend that we were going for because, say, we like the majority of the tone with a Marshall, but we just needed a little bit more uh, top endy stuff. So maybe you'd use a high watt and blend that with a Marshall. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's all a little, uh, you can find different personalities for guitar sounds by blending different heads. Yeah, so, cool. We'll do that. Yeah, I, I just had a, I just just realized as far as guitars go, I just want to briefly touch on acoustics as well. Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, how do you how do you like to mic up an acoustic? I mean, for me personally, I usually if I'm only using one mic, I usually like to kind of aim for around the twelfth fret, maybe about a foot away. Just think, so. Yeah. Uh, for me, the sound hole and just just the fretboard above the sound hole because yeah. you're getting the the strumming. Uh, sound of the strings strumming and there seems to be a nice you know if you get too close to the sound hole or down towards the back end of the guitar it gets kind of boomy so um, boomy yeah yeah but again it depends on, on the sound of that guitar and what you're going for um you know sometimes i'll double mic it you know have a like a, a thinner mic sort of 
at that back end and then uh, another one up by the sort of the fretboard and, and all that. And you can sort of blend that boominess in that, that can work for you mm-hmm. if the guitar bit of size because acoustics tend to be, you know, if you're trying to get rid of that boom, then all you're left with is like this jangly, you know, <laughs> you're left walk. with an with acoustic DI tone. Yeah, Which well, is the, warm worst sound, hard, the worst sound yeah. in the world. Yeah, a warm acoustic's <laughs> hard to get because it goes from boomy to, to jangly right away. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Acu- acoustics, uh, acoustics are very, uh, it's a finicky one, but I think generally for that, the thing you want to be aware of is it might make sense to stick it on the sound hole. Don't do that unless you want it to be very, very boomy. Um, yeah. I like to go for the 12th thread about a foot away. I like a little bit of room in my acoustics. Mm-hmm. personally mm-hmm. um yeah. and then there's the animal because especially for like singer songwriters of like acoustic and vocals at the same time right that's tough because you get the phase cancellation stuff uh or or the guitar will start sounding like it's in a in a cone filter like it's mm-hmm. hollow sounding because it's coming from the mic the vocal mic and that so yeah that takes a little bit more placement to get yeah, and, and and finesse like as far as as far as that kind of thing goes like uh for somebody who's just kind of trying to record themselves like if say you've got a would you suggest two different mics like a dynamic and a condenser or just like one well-placed condenser and then a properly nicely dynamic say, performance generally one well-placed mic is going to be the easiest for the for most people mm-hmm. because once you get two mics now you're dealing with phase so then it's really going to uh, depend on you know where each mic's placed and as they're playing and the acoustics are notorious for this is you know they're playing you get everything perfectly set and then they're playing and then for whatever reason they'll turn and then the sound <laughs> changes it's like okay oh yeah sometimes i'll tape things down so, okay stay between these pieces of tape <laughs> please yeah yeah I, f- I feel like yeah that one for for vocals too probably is like it's, it's, please do not step to either side of the microphone while you're recording. And I find, you know, the same thing with, with, um, you know, playing piano and singing at the same time, you'll get. Yeah. 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 Easy thing. So you just really just kind of be careful. Mm -hmm. Cool. I, yeah, just, I was realized we hadn't touched acoustic guitars and that's kind of an important thing. Um, let's see another question from bunker down with 25 mics on a drum kit, how do you approach controlling bleed to achieve the desired mix in the box or tons of dynamics hardware? Ultimately, it's kind of the same thing. It's processing, but I'm just, of, you know what? Yeah. Personally, I love the bleed. Bleed mm-hmm. is my friend because that really helps the drum sound real. You know, sometimes I'll get stuff other guys have recorded to mix and they've gone through it and uh, stripped all the sound off the tom. So, all of a sudden this tom appears and then goes away and you hear all the cymbal leakage in the tom when the tom's being played and then it goes away and it that drives me nuts. I like that leakage. All that little rumbling on the toms makes it sound real. And, you know, it's funny, a lot of sound of your cymbals is coming off the tom mics, even though they're pointed at the toms. So yeah. you find that balance. Now I find i got to ride the toms in the mix because if you pull them, up to the level so that when he's playing the toms, you hear the toms. Sometimes there's too much cymbals, but I like all that stuff. I like everything. I don't like any gates or anything on my drums. Cool. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, another one from Neil. With less experienced musicians, how much do you rely on comping or do you want a complete performance? I like a, a, a bit of both. I find, well, there's, we're we talking singing or or playing or I guess just in general. Okay. okay. Generally I like performance and that's, you know, all the way through because, you know, you, you start and stop too much. Sometimes people sort of lose track of where they're at in the song. So, you know, it becomes harder and it becomes more like tedious work when you, okay, let's do that one, that part one more time. Okay. Let's do that again. Whereas <laughs> if you play the song, you're, you're all getting into the song and say, okay, that's great. Okay. Now remember the second course, you need to go like this, you know, yeah. so uh, you might have to write little crib notes, but I prefer a performance and then picking different performances and making a comp track of that uh, works better than trying to zero in. But sometimes they just don't get a, a certain hard part and you've got to zero in on that. Let's just punch that again until it's right. But generally uh, whole performances. Cool. Uh, let's see. We'll do one last one here. Um 
from Ronson again on a project you're doing from start to finish. Uh, how much? Yeah, how much room for tone adjustment do you leave for the mix? Are you looking to record tones as close to being mixed as possible, or are you leaving yourself some wiggle room in terms of processing? I'd like to get it as close as possible, but I also like to leave wiggle room because um, a lot of times when I'm recording, I don't know completely everything else that's going on top of the song. You know, like they they may have all these other guitar parts I haven't heard yet, or so. Um, when I'm recording, a lot of times I like to get a nice clean signal to tape, you know, make sure there's enough bottom end, enough top end, it's clean, no crackles, no whatever. Uh, and then that'll give me room in the mix to take away some of the bottom, add a little bit more. You know, I've got room to, to play in the mix for sure, because uh, say I, I really go for a, a certain sound and I get a really thin sounding pokey guitar and now well, that's going to be great. And then in the mix, I'm like, oh, it's too thin. It's really hard to get any kind of size and bottom back onto it at that point. So I like to leave uh, some escape routes and options open for myself. Yeah, like, so it, it, it kind of kind of a like maybe just record a little bit more than what you might actually use in the mix, but yeah. keeping, yeah, kind of make sure that all of the material is absolutely there. <laughs> well, say, you know, yeah. late, late, you guys all decide, we decide to record the vocal uh, sounding like it was uh, through a little radio. And let's put a radio, you know, filter thing on and make it sound like a radio. That was a great idea at midnight. You come in the next morning and say, oh, not such a great idea. <laughs> you can't undo that. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, if you're going for an effect, go for it. And, and then you're living with it. So... Make sure it's what you want. <laughs> cool. Yeah, that, that sounds that sounds about right. Um, let's see. Last little thought, actually, is uh, mic placement on guitar cabs. Mm -hmm. um, just, yeah, that's that's a really important thing because that was one of the first things we talked about is, you know, what that sounds like when you stick a mic on a guitar cab. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you actually think about the, 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 the physical approach to that? Well, uh, what I do is I get my assistant to stand out there with headphones and they, and they move the mic around. And then when it sounds how we want it to sound or the, the best placement, of, okay, stop. And he'll stop. And, and then if I'm doing multiple mics, we'll do the next mic. And then I'll check the phase and then make any adjustments when checking the phase. And funny enough, I always find that, you know, there's your speaker and in the middle is the cone. I always find the mic is just off the cone is kind of the best spot. So sometimes if I'm in a hurry or don't have an assistant to, to sort of, you know, uh, move the mic around for me, I'll just stick it right there. It's just, just off the cone seems to be the best spot because the cone gets really bright too far off the cone. It gets a little bit hollow sounding. So yeah. just off the cone, you get some of that, that brightness, but you also get the uh, sort of the meat of the, the sound. Cool. Do you just like physically move it this way or do you do like rotating it or? Physically, left yeah. to right, up, down, and and also sometimes in and out. Sometimes it sounds really good right up on the on the grill of the speaker. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it sounds better further back. Uh, yeah, because you want to be thinking about low end and proximity effect there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, if you want a bigger, boomier sound, you can you know stick the mic right up on it. If you want it a little more roomy, less you know. Yeah. Less just abrasive, low end, pull it back kind of stuff. But uh, cool. Yeah. I think that just about covers it. Mike, thank you so much for joining oh, yeah. today. My pleasure. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And if anybody's got any other questions, uh, you can look at my website for my uh, email. Just shoot me an email and I'm happy to answer what I can. Yeah, and again, that's uh, that's MikeFraserMix.com, um, and there's going to be a recording of this that's going to go up uh, in the next few days for everybody if you want to watch it again or share it. Uh, there's also going to just be some extra little resources that are going to go out in the next few hours for everybody that registered as well. But uh, again, Mike, thank you so much. Thanks to everybody who came and uh, yeah. everybody have a lovely weekend. Yeah. Thanks everybody for coming. And I, you know, I hope I helped answer some questions. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I thought we had a really good discussion. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Thanks, thanks everybody. everybody. All right. All right. Take care. Everybody have a great weekend.